Hello listeners, Bryony here. Just a quick warning that there's some colourful language in this podcast, so it might not be one to listen to with children around. Right, now that's out of the way. I hope you enjoy the show. The new generation, they can't consume the level of alcohol that I did and play to that level. It's just not done now. My experience, most of the people that we're getting, if they're current players, then it's gambling addiction. Gambling addiction is the one that's pretty much epidemic in in professional football. Hello, my name's Bryony Gordon, and I want to welcome you to this special series of Mad World. And I say special series because it covers a subject I know all too well. Addiction. Addiction, recovery and mental health go hand in hand. And as many of you may know, it's a journey I've been on and I'm still on. So for this year's Addiction Awareness Week, the Mad World team have joined forces with the amazing charities Action on Addiction and the Forward Trust to bring you a series of honest conversations about addiction, be that to alcohol, drugs, gambling or something else. We're slowly breaking down the stigma of discussing mental health, but addiction still sadly remains taboo, even though we will all know someone who's been touched by it, which means I'm especially grateful to my guests on this series for having the courage to speak to me. As a lifelong Arsenal supporter, I'm a bit excited about Mm. today's guest. He's one of the team's most legendary players, captaining them in three separate decades and through one of their most successful periods. But he is also an alcoholic, and he has done as much in his career to challenge the stigma around addiction as he has to win titles for Arsenal. It is, of course, the wonderful Tony Adams. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Oh, Thank did you. you like it? Yeah, it was all right. You could have done it a little bit more, to be honest with you. Could I? Yeah, okay. Oh, you, you also captained England. England. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, Sorry. I have to be, remain humble here. I, I've got some more <laughs> things. So just pepper. Just no, to, okay, just if to... I'm feeling a bit low, I need a bit of a prop up the old self-esteem. <laughs> just throw something in. <laughs> so, Tony, the first question we ask all of the guests is... How are you really right now in this moment? I'm in a really good place. You know, my life's really balanced. I'm probably playing too much golf, but I've got work, relationships. You know, I've been 25 years in in therapy now and uh, I've worked at it. I've put a lot of action in uh, and a lot of change has gone on and I'm reaping the benefits. It's, uh, you know, I really am in a really peaceful place. You know, the, the committee's gone in the head. I do the next right thing, the next loving thing, and uh, I'm really at peace today. I'm work, I do a bit of service. I do a couple of meetings a week, and I see my therapist, my psychotherapist that I've been seeing for the last 25 years now and again now, and I've got some real great friends, and, and all my, I've got all my kids home for the weekend, and we're going to see James Bond. So I've got five out of the six coming home and, uh, and spending the weekend James Bond on Sunday, so can't wait. There you go. Listen, that's where I am today. That's, uh, <laughs> I remember back in... You got sober in 1996? Correct. August the 16th, it was my last drink. It was a pint of Guinness with a brandy in it and I was starting to cry and I, and I surrendered. Don't know what it was, to be honest with it. it just, uh, um, I had just asked for help down deep inside of me and it still makes me emotional today. You know, It's just uh, um, a moment of clarity, a, a surrender moment. I just went, oh, I've had enough. I've had enough. It's sick and tired. I got pissed once too much. You know, I drank too much, too often for too long. And I just threw the towel in and uh, I always said, John, I came in with a boxer, John John C, and he always said about, it's very alien for us, you know, he was a boxer and he was taught never to throw the towel in, you know, mm. <laughs> fight, 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 you're not a drunk, you're not a drunk, you're not a drunk. And my my release came at that end. And uh, as soon as I threw the towel in, I started to win, you know, and my life uh, asked for help and uh, and my life has been unbelievable since that day. I remember reading your book, Addicted, Mm. which came out in like 1998. 98, I did that, yeah. I got a quarter of a million for that and after tax, 160 odd, 170 grand, which I give to my charity to start Sporting Chance. So I'm very proud of that. Well, we'll talk a bit more about that later. But I remember reading that and like thinking, oh my God. And so I was probably about 18 and already, you know, drinking a lot. But I remember reading it and I remember it was such an honest book like you talk about wetting yourself you know you go into like the real details well, alcoholism's not pretty you know? no. and when I was doing a book I wanted to do warts and all you know it's no point you're only sick as your secrets and I needed I, I was going through the 12-step program and I was on step four and I did a, a personal one but I when I did the step five which is a opening up to all the things that you've done 
and sharing it with another human being. I, I didn't get the relief because most of my baggage, if you call it, was done in public. And I think I needed to do a um, get the skeletons out the cupboard, as it were, in, in normal people's talk. So I've got no secrets anymore. Mm. And I just put it all out there. And I did it with a, a, another guy that was in, in the fellowship with me. And he knew me better than me. And uh, it, it just worked. And I did it with News of the World, to be completely honest with you, because I thought Sunday morning, if someone's reading it, I serialised it in the News of the World. <laughs> um, and it has got, I got a bit chills down my spine then, because it has got, not me, the book is definitely meant to be, you know. Mm. And uh, there's so many people who have read it like yourself and gone, wow, that, that really resonated with I wasn't ready at the time, no. but later on down the road, I've kind of remembered the bits in there about you weeing yourself and about the blackouts and about the, mm. the the prison and the intensive care, 29 stitches. And I, me too, and gone, right, okay, actually, I mean, need to get some help here. Yeah. So it has saved a lot of people's lives, that book. It was astonishing. And actually, I showed you earlier, I've got this picture <laughs> of me with Tony and I'm about 18 and I'm probably just at the beginning of my journey as an alcoholic and you're just at the beginning of your journey as a sober person in recovery. I look quite well there. You so, look really you know, well. I think I'm all right. Yeah. I think I'm all right You know, then, you yeah. were probably about two years, yeah, I don't know. Like, oh, I was living the dream in them early days I of was, recovery. I'm so honest. I need to put this picture on Instagram <laughs> because I look like the happiest girl in the world and I was I remember being so excited I think it's important to say you know I was lucky enough to play six years clean and sober and I won two doubles I was more successful I fulfilled myself as a player and as a human being you know so it's really important because some people go into the oh I'm not going to be like that you know because the drink and, the, and and all that and the drugs and stuff it wasn't my experience when I cleaned up I was a better player. I was very successful beforehand, you know, but it was a drinking culture at that. And a lot of my alcoholism got buried because a lot of people were drinking heavily. It was a big difference that, alcoholic and heavily. I I played drunk three times. I got pulled off twice. I I said to George, the manager, I'm not very well today, boss. I'm not very well. And kind of disguised it. And he went, oh, thanks for trying. You know, I was like, oh, got done it. I got away with it again this time. And uh, and, uh, I got man in a match against Sheffield United. Sheffield United must be really rubbish. Sorry about all the Sheffield United (laughs) fans out there. But I got man in a match. They give me a stainless steel knife and fork set because the Sheffield stainless steel. And I'm I'm looking out the window going, how confusing is this? You know? you were drunk. I, I'm really, well, not drunk, you know, night after you've had a skin fall, you know, you're, you're on a balance. I used to be on a balance. Well, actually, if I try and sober up now, I'm going to be in a worse situation. So I just have a bit of a top up and go and run around for 90 minutes. So that's what I kind of did the morning of the game. And, you know, alcoholism's a, a progressive illness for me. Definitely at the start, I only pretty much drunk injuries and holidays, mm-hmm. you know, because football was a nuss. Football was my first drug of choice. It really was. Every, it did everything that alcohol did later on in life. You know, it suppressed all my thoughts and feelings. It suppressed it all. You know, I didn't have to think. I didn't have to feel. I was on the football pitch. I was doing my stuff. Off the pitch, complete mess. Low self-esteem, emotionally kind of broken. Well, not broken because you have to know about it. I was unconscious to all this stuff. So I'm waffling, aren't I? I'm no, wa- it's brilliant. <laughs> I lo- please carry on. Waffle as much as you want. So it's, it's confusing it, and, it, and it's baffling. And... Right at the end, it's 12 years. So there was periods of abstinence through football, but it got me, you know, and it became worse and worse and worse. And and I think it's really interesting, actually, this, that we won the league in 89 and 91, and we didn't win the league again until I sobered up. Mm. You know, we've become a very good cup team. When you've got the captain that can't, I couldn't get up physically. I I was consuming so much alcohol. I couldn't get up for, you know, a Saturday game and play midweek. Completely out. Yeah, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. The physical demand of that, training, getting into work and doing So I was kind of, all right, I was getting up for the cup games and we won the FA Cup and the League Cup and went on 94, we won the European Cup, Winners' Cup. So I did it for the cup games. In the league, you see our position, we're mid-table, you know, because the captain's not there. You know, he's not, not got the captain there. He's not physically up to doing his job. So I had to sober up and then we won the, the double in 98 where I was playing free as a bird, to be completely honest with you. And you don't... You know, we ain't even mentioned the statue and stuff, but, um, you know, you don't get a statue if I don't sober up. You've got to, you know, I've got to tell you that, you know, I, I'm dead at the end of that drinking. I, I, I was in such a painful, I didn't want to live. You know, I don't want to be on this planet anymore. It was just too painful. Everything 
kind of was a perfect storm, came up, the this, the that, the everything, the wife had left me, the kids had gone, everything had come to an end. And I just didn't want it. And that's when I prayed to it. I don't know what it was, but it just, you know, I just kind of said, I've, I've had enough here, guys. I've had enough here. It's interesting. I wanted to kind of talk about the fellowship and 12 steps because actually on all the other podcasts we've done on this, we haven't really touched on it. So when we refer to the 12 steps and being in the rooms, we're talking about Alcoholics Anonymous or if people are drug, it's usually Narcotics Anonymous. But I think there's 60 now fellowship groups. 60 you different. Every country in the world as well. It's amazing. I've been around the world with this fellowship. Lots of people don't talk about it because there's mm, traditions and obviously there's anonymity. But I want to talk a bit about it now because I think it's it's almost disingenuous not to talk about sobriety without mentioning, you know, this mm. amazing thing that that helps people. But also that one of the big misconceptions is, you know, people think it's religious mm. and actually it's about something bigger than yourself, really, isn't it? Absolutely. Spiritual. You, as long as it's not you. you, know, you know, we have to piece that in. You know, it's an ego deflating program. Yeah. So we have to hopefully take the ego down and the, and the self-esteem and humility has to come up. You know, we have to get some kind of grip on that. Because yeah. I, I don't know about you, but, you know, I had lots and lots of pats on the back for what, <laughs> what I did and not who I was. Yeah. You know, and so once that ego is getting patted every day, you're England captain, wow, what a blah. You know, but off the pitch, you're feeling like a piece of shit. Yeah, I you was know? never England captain <laughs> during my drinking. I didn't manage so there, those heady heights. Is, Probably just as well. But it's the same illness, you know. It's yeah. the same illness, and my drug of choice was was uh, um, was alcohol. But there's there's gambling, there's there's drugs, there's sex. And, you know, gambling and gaming at the moment. You know, mm. it's out there. Uh, my journey. I can only talk about my journey, and my journey was from one to one therapy, a psychotherapist, and and put it in layman terms. I was dying. My mother in law, God bless her, gave me a number of someone that was one of us, one of us. And he carried the message to me. Oh, emotional, getting teary. He carried the message. I saw a man that had his dignity, self-respect. I didn't at mm. that moment, but I saw it and I went, wow, I want some of this. And he said, well, let's go to a meeting. And then you get into your stuff and, you know, panic attacks when you're a kid and all through the 12 steps program into step four and all the, the, the marvellous. It comes later on for me, you know, but the, the initial... Part of the, my journey was one-to-one -one therapy and a person that carried the message. Really simplistic like that. Yeah, it and is astonishing. Help, yeah. Do you mind if we go back a bit to before you before you surrendered to the fact that you're an alcoholic and just just to give an idea to maybe younger listeners Ooh. who <laughs> who uh, who only know football? No, 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 no. And I'm, no, I'm it keeps me about, humble. <laughs> they weren't born when I sobered up. A lot of these kids. Are, but, <laughs> well, but it's funny, you know. Like it's not funny. Obviously, alcoholism is not funny. But no, it's not pretty. Like the but what is funny once you're out of it? And yeah, through it and there you, is some you laughing. Let go of it. Yeah. But there, but honest, uh, genuine laughter. It's hard now to think like you're talking about the drinking culture in football mm. in Britain, and it's hard now to to imagine when you look at you know the players on the pitch at Euros that that would work now. And of course, there was a lot of excess. I think the money, you know, in the in the Premier League, we can we can go back there to '93 and and the influence of, of became the richest league in, in the world, and players from all round and coaches from all around the world came into the the Premier League. So uh, and with it became the best scientists, the best physiologist. So it is a, a wave of uh, of movement. But your you point about the the new generation, they can't consume the level of alcohol that I did and play to that level. It's just not done now. You know, that my experience and, and Sporting Chance now, 21 years old, we most of the people that we're getting, if they are playing current players, then it's gambling addiction. Okay. You know, it's gambling addiction is the one that's, that's pretty much epidemic in, in, in professional football. Really? You know, in the rugby league, you've got tramadol, prescription drugs are, are, are quite uh, prevalent. Uh, different sports, you know, coke, uh, weight loss for jockeys and stuff. So, but if you're talking about professional footballers, then it, it definitely their, their drug of choice is not alcohol at this, when they're 
playing. Now, when they retire or maybe holidays, and we've seen a few players that have got a little bit of trouble during yeah. the holiday periods and maybe gone to excess and drunk alcoholically or heavy, you know, might have not crossed the line as I did because I, you know, I had 11 and a half years of drinking. And I, didn't, I never, you know, wanted to drink. You know, prison intensive care, I was completely in denial. You know, I didn't want to let go. And then I realised I crossed the line. And when I crossed the line, the most frightening place of my life was I actually didn't want to drink anymore because I knew what it was doing to me. Yeah. But I was still getting drunk. It's the most frightening place. You've lost all control. You've lost all choice. You know, it's not a question of this illness got to the really core of me. And I, it took me, the, the compulsion to drink was in me so, so much. All of a sudden, I'm drinking. There was no defence from that first drink. Yeah. I'm listening and it's coming up that thing of like that that thing of not wanting to drink but not knowing how to stop and it's scary it's a horrible scare yeah it's frightening I feel a bit <laughs> my tears are coming up now and it's like gambling as well it's the same illness you know mentally and emotional illness and we've got a mm. spiritual solution and going back to your God yeah I don't know what it is over 25 years now and I do meditation quite a bit and I get to know it's like a good something in the pit of my stomach tells me the right thing to do yeah. you know I know really it's inside it's an inside job for me you know yeah, yeah, yeah. but I have to take myself away and out of this mad world there you go back to your podcast <laughs> Thanks, there you go that was good. <laughs> Get out of the mad world yeah. and go and sit on my own and reflect mm. on my thoughts and feelings. I lost my mum and dad to cancer. It was horrific. My mum held her hand for nine months of bone cancer. <sighs> what a bone, sober experience. And I got through it. I got through it, you know, and I, and I was there for her, mm. you know, like my dad. And I've been in jobs and I've been out of jobs. It's all won't, I won't pick up because of this stuff now. You know, I know the secrets. I know how to stay stopped. I mm. think that's the that's the big thing now. I know actually how to stay stopped, and it's because I take responsibility for my mental health and my emotional sobriety. There's still a hell of a lot of stigma <laughs> attached to mental illness and alcoholism and stuff. But now, in the year 2021, but when you got sober oh, in wow. 1996, yeah. like... I was at, a weirdo, mate. They, well, <laughs> but also, like... They were really uncomfortable with me sobering up, you know, a lot of people. But the good thing is, what other people think of me has got nothing to do with It's none me. of your business. None of my business, mate. Tiny. None of my business. But, th th you know, like, you went to prison. Mm. Can you tell me? Oh, wow. We've got Chelmsford Prison. Yeah. Uh, I've now got a fellowship group inside it. You know, first time, 31 years ago, I was in there, Chelmsford Prison. I'm going back in there on the 2nd of December. Wow. You know, part of my other hat is uh, I joined the Forward Trust, which is they do prison service. Um, we got into about 50 prisons. I think it's come right down now in the 112 prisons because I went to prison in 1990, as you said, got no education why I was in there. Why was I in there? Because I got in a, my car four times over the legal limit on a Sunday afternoon and went straight over an A road doing 80 miles an hour. Lost control, ended up in someone's front room. You know, that was, you know, I could have killed everybody, myself. And actually, I've, I've driving for seven years and the first time I never put my seatbelt on. And that day, for the first time in seven years, I put my seatbelt on, saved my life. But I drunk, and there's the insanity. The problem drinker, you go to prison, you come out of prison, you, you kick the ball about, you do your stuff. But I think with it, I've got two years, my license taken away from me. I think it was, I want to say weeks, but I think it was days after getting my license back, I was drinking and driving again. Really? That, my friend, is insanity. You've been to prison because of this and you've got no education. It, it might not have helped. It might not have helped in prison at the time when I went into Shelmsford Prison in 1990. It might not have helped. I might not have been ready. Probably weren't going to be ready, but a seed might have been sown. If someone had come up to you and said, oh, you think you're struggling with your drinking? <laughs> you know, you're weighing yourself, you know, you're blackouts. you got problems with your drinking. Forget about once you get your licence back two years later that you're, that you're drinking and driving again. It's the fact that you crash into the front, into someone's living room. You end up in prison. You, you know, you're all over the fucking front pages. Do you know what I mean? And you still carry on drinking after that. 
Yeah. No, but that's it's madness. That and that. Oh, it's a mental illness. Yeah. You know, and it's. Uh, I, I can see now, like a day, and a lot of work on myself. The the reasons why I I was doing that. You know, it does affect the same part of the brain as you know. You talk to the scientists, the same as the football did. You know, mm. it did that that drive that that bit in here. That one more game. I'm, I've got the disease of more. You know, you know, one more coffee, one more biscuit. Mm-hmm. You know, I've got the disease of that. I'll, I'll take it to excess. Sugar and caffeine for me today, hallelujah, and a bit too much golf. But apart from that, I'm, I'm kind of... They're probably I'm not going right. to kill They're you. They're not going to kill me, are they? But hang on, you'd say you know why you were doing it. Why were you... If you're not an well, alcoholic... Oh, it's an amazing drug, you know. Uh, it, 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 take, it, it took me to some, some risky places, but it, it, the artificial kind of high that you get from it, you know, it's wow, wow you know, I mean, the buzz. It must be a reason why I did it in the first yeah, place, yeah, you know. Yeah. It was, and, and I take my hour off. If anyone can and drink it, uh, you know, sensibly, uh, then, then away you go, you know. It's a, it's a take the edge off life or whatever it is. Mother's little helper, they, you know, if you want a couple of drinks, come home from work of an evening and it, it just chills you out. Hallelujah. Mm. I I never drunk like that. It's not my experience. Mm. <laughs> it's to oblivion. I wanted out, you know. Mm. What I mean, I wanted away, you know. People can't understand this stuff. The civilian, and hopefully, you know, my wife's a civilian, and and hopefully she, she won't have to go to the place that I that I went. So by stuff, civilian, so. you mean someone oh, civilian, who's not sorry. an alcoholic? No, just because not, not a, I get all not of enough these references, like but <laughs> I hope that there'll be people listening to this who will be learning lots about alcoholism. And well, hopefully if they're that will... learning about it and they're, they're taking an interest, there's places where you can go, and hopefully you, you do that on the podcast. You can signpost to the appropriate places and, mm-hmm. and reach out, and, and if you are needing you know called 999 if you know we've still got so many suicides going on it's ridiculous men 17 a week or something ridiculous mm. you know we've got two a day in the uk four with 400 try to commit suicide every 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 day and 18 go through with it it's just ridiculous because because what we i did suppress 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 you mm. know it's it's horrific you know it and it stays this illness i believe wants us on our own and the opposite for addiction for me is connection. Mm-hmm. Just by coming here, I've had all the therapy that I need today. I've come here and I've opened my mouth and I've shared it with another human being. It's made me connected. It's made me part of this world. If I don't do this, it stays inside and I rot. Mm-hmm. And I rot and I take it and I kind of start to go, hmm, I mm, don't really, I, you know, 25 years without a drink, I, I can handle this. Mm-hmm. I don't need to go to a meeting. I don't need to talk to her. I don't need that. You know, I go and I could do something else. What makes me feel good? I go, I go and I go and have a cup of you know coffee, and all of a sudden you slip. I've seen it done over the twenty five years, or people uh, change their drug of choice. You know, they go from gambling to drinking, to drinking to drugging, to drugging back to gambling. You know, they choose it, they're acting out on sex or, or whatever. They swap it. They swap it over and uh, work, workaholic. I've been a workaholic in recovery, you know, doing emails at four in the morning. Just have a little check. What's your relationship with that? It don't have to be, as gambling tells you, it's not a substance that you put inside of you. So what is your relationship with gambling? I've got, I choose not to bet today, even though it wasn't my drug of choice. I know that if I might do, I might want one more bet, you know. So you so you said earlier that you think gambling addiction is epidemic in professional football. Mm. You know, there's some people, footballers, that gamble and don't have an issue with it. Mm -hmm. There's some footballers that drink (laughs) in holidays and stuff and, you know, can walk away, you know. But there is a percentage of the population. The footballers don't stand outside of uh, of society. We're a part of it. You know, it's the same stats from footballers as as there is, you know, uh, bankers or, or presenters or journalists or you know it's the same stats there's going to be a section of that society that want once more bet Mm -hmm. that they're going to chase stuff they're going to you know they're going to mortgage their house to pay for a bet they're going to nick their christmas money to to go and have a bet you know it was this case for me with the drinking and stuff you know you've got to put something together you know for the morning for the for the kids in the morning for their birthday and you're absolutely paralytic and you've got a three-day bender and you know there's going to be a a section of of the current players, and we're we're getting it. I saw I was with the guys on Tuesday. You know, we had four guys in 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 the clinic, and the old see the old footballers. There's one rugby league player and, and three footballers, and and the current fo- footballer he's gambling addict, and the two footballers because they're 
my age now. Right. And we usually get them like that when they're, excuse me, but their ass is hanging out their backside, you know, okay. and, uh, and, you know, and... Uh, is that what ones... you call retired football players? What? Is that what you say? <laughs> you're a retired football player, your ass is hanging out the back. No, no, no. <laughs> no, it's with the illness as well. Yeah, 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 Do you understand? Because yeah, 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 there is yeah. some that's that got the dignity and got the self-respect and, and, and have not travelled down the past. But I'm talking the ones that... My ass you know, has 50%. definitely been hanging out of the back. <laughs> 50% of footballers get divorced in the first three years of retirement and 50% go skin. Is that the, true? The, yeah, PFA figures. So they lived at such a level, then all of a sudden... And, you, and the average career of a professional footballer is only six years. So you're getting mixed messages. Kids are getting mixed messages because they see these top athletes and they can only see that top end of the branch because it's so attractive that's why I opened my treatment centre and my clinic um, you know, Sporting Chance 21 years ago so I'm not a good therapist you yeah. know, I'm not a good counsellor you know I've just got my own set of experiences and my own way that I got clean and sober so I wanted to give them to other people and that's why I did I want you to have the life that I've I've got you know I want you to have the freedom I want you to be free of this illness, you know, because it's, whoa, here we go again. Tears have welled up, but it's been such a wonderful life, you know, and yeah. I was so trapped and I was so dead. I always say 29, I didn't want to live, and at 49, I didn't want to die, yeah. you know, and I've gone through a, a, a transformation. I will shut up. <laughs> no, don't. Please don't. That's what we want. We want you here yeah, to mate, talk I'm about too it. Teary. Sporting Chance is remarkable to think that you, you get this huge check from the publishers for this incredible book that has all these many years later, I was 18 then, so how old? I'm 41 now, has stayed with me. I remember, I can, I remember sitting in my bedroom and reading it and saying to myself, even then, like, I knew I drank too much and I knew I was out of control. But I remember saying, well, I've never, I've never wet myself. Yet. I remember actually saying to myself... Well, yeah, but I've never been drunk playing for Arsenal. It's like, no, Bryony, you haven't because you don't fucking play for Arsenal. You're a, you know what I mean? I need to reread it, actually. But it was that, I, I still, I just remember it so clearly, having that conversation in my head, that sort of almost negotiations that you have mm. when you're in absolute denial of your mm. problem. Not as bad as me, huh? Yeah, we always it's say, don't we? We refrain, say, we say yet, and we talk about the lift going down, don't we? We talk about the lift going down to the bottom. You can get off at any floor, you know. You don't have to keep going down. I've heard some horrific stories that are, that's worse than my story. You know, I, I got off when I got off, and thank God I got off. You know, and I, and and I take my hat off to young kids that that get the message at an early age because they've got a wonderful life ahead of them, but they've not hardly done any damage. You know, but they can see the car crash coming. And they can see it up down the road, and they could say, "Oh wow, yeah, I got that." You know, when I drink like this, this happened. These are the consequences that happen. Not every time. You know, <laughs> what they say, I don't get in trouble every time I drink, but every time I got in trouble, while I was drunk. Yeah. So I remember going when I when I found myself at rehab, and they asked me like twenty questions to kind of assess my suitability, yeah. and I. I said yes to every single one of them except for one, which was, do you ever wake up in the morning and, and have a drink? And I was like, God, no. <laughs> and I remember the counsellor saying to me, not yet. And, and then I thought to myself, but what about those times when I've still been awake? Exactly. And drinking Three, four in the, in the morning, morning. You're still drinking, aren't you? Why am I here now <laughs> in this rehab? Because my last drink, my last alcoholic drink was August the 27th, 2017. And it was at 10 in the morning, you know. I did that. Can I just share back to you on, on the 20 questions? Because I did it before I got into the rooms. Yeah. And I got one, two out of 20. When I'm stuck in denial, it's really interesting this, I think, because I looked at it and honest to God, I looked at it and went, oh, no, 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 no. Maybe that one. Maybe about one, two out of 20. And then when I got into the rooms, I went, Jesus Christ. Mm. And I got 19 out of 20. And the only one that I didn't have wasn't the drinking in the morning because I, I, I drunk in the morning. Because when you're a bender drinker, you're just picking up, poof, can't wait to Top get up. smashed again because it's a better feeling than the feeling of waking up and coming to. You know, never have hangovers, drink through them. But the one that got me was I didn't steal alcohol. Right. Because I had a lot of cash, I suppose. I didn't. I just need, going, to. Need, need to. But I got. Hold on a minute. I said we had a we had a bar. It was a horseshoe where I used to drink. I used to drink everywhere. But one of the bars that I used to drink was a horseshoe bar, and um, 
when the barman was around the other side of the bar, I leant over and topped myself up. So that's not stealing, that's a laugh. You see how the justification mm. went in there? That's a giggle. That's a bit of banter. You know, no, that's actually stealing alcohol <laughs> when the barman's around the other side. <laughs> you know, mm. eh? but so I'm 20 out of 20, but kick on. And so am I. <laughs> I remember that thing that the analogy of the lift, which is, you know, addiction mm. is a lift going down and you can choose to get off at any floor you want, but mm. if you get back on, you will go lower. Yeah, I've lost a lot of pals in unfortunately and it's a worse place to be when you've got a little bit of recovery in your head and you know a belly full of booze it's uh it's a really you know i've seen people bounce along at the bottom for years and my heart goes out to them because it wasn't my experience i don't know why i got it straight away but i did you know i got it straight away and and, and why they can't let go it's incredible. They talk about a lack of willpower. I think it's extremely courageous to be to be scrapping away. Just throw the tail and get a go, mm. you know. Yes. You want to shake them and go, just give in. But they're still going round again, having one more fight with it, having one more fight. No, I can do it. I can do that. Yeah, completely trapped in their illness. Huh? It's so sad. Well, I didn't get it the first time. I had a few relapses and and I knew I remember the last one I had I knew, remember thinking I know that whatever brings me in if I'm lucky you know and actually I didn't have that kind of foresight at the time but if I'm lucky enough to come back in because actually mm. lots of people don't I could have died but I knew whatever was going to bring me in and get me sober was going to be worse than the last time you know that thing you say that's so powerful of like I I remember saying to this counsellor I haven't lost my husband, I haven't lost my daughter, mm. I haven't lost my job. Mm. And he was like, well, do you want to go out and lose them all before mm. you come back in? Wise man, mm. lady. It was a man, actually, yeah. it was a man. And um, we have all of these bottoms, don't we? But really the ultimate bottom is death. Why do I have five houses, two cars, no driving licence, and what, two, no, three cars and two boats at the end of my drinking and, uh, you know, and, and completely wanting to die? You know, it's not a question of money, this or, or material, uh, material things. It just doesn't work. You know, you can keep fixing all you want. You know, this illness is going to get you. Mm. This is going to get you. You know, you can shove it down, act out in different ways. If you've got this illness, it's uh, um, yeah. Mm. You know, so we're I'm abstinence, and I, I think the twelve step program, and there's millions of us that are, that are clean and sober, and uh, yeah, I don't know any other alternative for the disease of addiction so i was going to say if there's anyone listening now who mm. is having problems like obviously we are signposting to all sorts of organizations but what would your like advice for them be on a sort of almost like a spiritual mental health level you know oh uh, i'm kind of in the business now you know i've, I've started a new company in during lockdown because i felt because my charity is for sports people i felt handcuffed that I couldn't help everybody else. So now I started a company that does look after everybody else. So, really? Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about yeah, that? Yeah, it's 6MHS, it's my number six, and but I, it's the letters. And I started with businesses because I wanted to take the strain off the NHS and I wanted to take the strain off of uh, um, the doctors and GPs that were, you know, big businesses earning big money, you know, big kind of... And I, I will disclose one business because they've really taken the lead on it and it's, it's the builders, merchants, or, um, Juicens, and, and we look after Juicens and employees. They, they, they earn a lot of money and, and government gave them a bit of money to employ people during lockdown and stuff, not to lay them off. So they're like, actually, let's give it to our employees. Let's look after the mental health of our employees. So we've had about 137 reached out since January that are in one-to-one -one therapy with us. And it's numerous things. It's gone from back before the COVID was uh, depression, anxiety, but now uh, it, we're having what's been presented is, is, is bereavement and uh, trauma mm -hmm. because of the levels. The last thing you see is granddad on your iPad and uh, people ain't been having the opportunity to grieve that the, the natural process of saying goodbye to your loved ones at funerals and things like that. We haven't had that, you know, through lockdown, we've not been able to say, like I said, you've got granddad, bye-bye granddad, you know, in hospital, mm -hmm. you know, family's not around his bed, you know, that's, whew. 
you know, really painful mm. stuff for people. And they're, and they're like, if you don't, and my experience again, if you suppress all that, you're going to make yourself worse. So that sort of thank the Lord they're, they're picking up the phones and they're asking, you know, I've got a network of counsellors across the UK because my 20, 21 years of doing it with sports people. You know, I can do it with businesses, but I do it for individuals as well. So, um, yeah, I can't help the world. I had this conversation so many times. I think you've got to concentrate on your own program and carry the message and and do things like this on occasion when it feels right and you've got an, another soul on the same destiny and the same path that, that understands what addiction is and what mental health is because half the people out there don't even know what mental health is, mm. you know, mental illness or, or emotional problems. I've got no wise words for you. If, you, if you're simply... What I did was ask for help and hopefully it's creating a safe place where they can go and get the appropriate things because, you know, Prince William, bless him, he came down as president of the FA, he came down to my charity in 2014 and it's it's like a you're opening up a can of worms. You want to put this on the agenda. You want to put mental health on the agenda. Hallelujah. Yeah, let's put it on the agenda. Let's start talking about all that stuff. But then if you don't back them up, if you don't back it up with the appropriate services, and on the NHS, I think it's nine months to a year before mm. you can get to see anyone. You know, it's too long. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm struggling, I need it and I need it now. You know, we did it in 30 minutes. My, my girl on the phone line the other day, she did it with one of the employees of, of Juice and got the appropriate help in the right part of the country with the right presenting issues you know you're not going to do cbt for addiction or you're not going to do this for that you know it's marrying them up and that's priceless Mm. and i've got some great people like i did with the charity Mm. Uh, i've done it now for kind of everybody else so it felt a bit like a bit like a plug then didn't it it's it's, it's it's completely not because i i know i'm not going to waste my time with people that don't want this Mm. You know, you know what I mean. You are actually banging your head up against a brick wall because if someone had come to me, but you can throw little messages out there. You yeah. can, you can, and and do books and do little podcasts now and again. You know, I've got podcasts coming out of my arse and I don't do them. You know, but every now and again I go, well, that might, that might help someone. And if it might help someone, you know, AA's got an amazing, you know, the helpline, give them a call. Mm. You know, if you if you feel like you're having problems with your uh, with alcohol or if you feel like you have problems with, with your with your gambling, G A A A N A, the, the all the fellowship groups are out there. You know, go to your GP, you know. I, I don't want to persuade anybody not to go to their JP. You know, go to your GP and uh, hopefully there's a training process with them as well, you know, because it takes one to know one, mm. you know, and it takes an addict to know one. We are everywhere. We didn't have these phones, did we? Mm. We didn't have these phones back in the day. And it still, and the scientists prove it, it still affects the same part of the brain as the drinking of the alcohol, you know, mm. all them pickups. You know, you, you're playing with your phone at three in the morning, all those messages you're getting through it. You know, it's the new world. Mm. And you can put, you know, there's going to be a gaming clinic, I'm sure there is, yeah, yeah. Know, around the corner. But for me, and I've got to say this, it's all the same illness. Mm-hmm. It's all the same illness. I happen to pick up alcohol. You know, that was my football first and then alcohol. You know, I, I'm an addict. At the end of the day, I'm an addict and I can pick up anything out there. So I strive for balance today, which is the, the, the counter, mm. the counter. And I don't tend to, you know, I'm quite balanced. After I won the double, you know, that balance, you know, that, that, that kind of that point in my head, the, the pleasure dome, the dopamine release, it was like authentic and, and my self-esteem. It was coming from a different place. It was like, yeah, I've done a really good job there. I've done a really good job. Not ego. No, I hadn't gone into ego and like thinking that I'm the do- God's gift and I'm going to go disco dancing all night. You can go disco dancing if you want. I went over to the park and walked my dog and it was just beautiful. And then I went for a bite a meal with the guys. You know, I wanted to retain that great feeling of doing something well. I couldn't understand why I used to suppress that one. Mm. That is a wonderful, wonderful feeling. Enjoy it. We're very, very lucky to have had you in our art studio on Mad World because you're a legend and um, what you've done for, as I say, obviously what you did for Arsenal was pretty awesome (laughs) and hasn't quite been replicated since. But to stand up and talk about this stuff so openly is really generous. Thank you. And it's not easy, you know. You know we do it because of us. We do it for our own 
you of know, course. it's like paradoxical, selfish. It makes me well of by, course. by saying this stuff. But I don't have to. You're right. I can kind of go back and uh, and keep it all for myself. You got, but you, Tony, you got up this morning and you got on a train and mm. you came all the way here and you sat in this studio and you've mm. been talking about dark stuff, you know, mm. and, and that is incredible and then not only that the book addicted you know the money you got from that you set up this amazing clinic called sporting chance and this is what it's all about isn't it it's about taking negatives and turning them into positives isn't it it's just been my journey keep it simple you know i've done the next right thing that i feel i've been messing about with the football industry since i retired in 2002 nearly 20 years and thinking oh do i need this and i've had a venture after a venture in that world been to China, Azerbaijan, you know, some great, set up a meeting in Azerbaijan, you know, that, that that's for me, why was you in Azerbaijan for six years? Was it to build a football club or start a meeting? They've got a daily meeting now in Baku, you know, was it to help people save people's lives, you know, was that the purpose? And I've just come to the conclusion since, uh, since 2018, really, when I came back from China, actually, I just think it, my conscience wants me to do this stuff mm -hmm. you know and and it wants me to be well it wants me to carry the message it wants me to keep things simple it wants me to talk about my my dark days because it, it helps people to get out of their dark days yeah well you've certainly helped me today tony adams and that is a that's a sentence i really liked saying <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for Pleasure. coming on mad world Pleasure. Before you go, please follow Mad World on your podcast app to make sure you never miss an episode. And if you feel like it, leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. I love to read what you think about the shows and see your guest suggestions too. The Telegraph also let me loose in the paper. So if you'd like to hear more from me, head to telegraph.co.uk forward slash madworld and you can get your first 30 days access to the website completely free. This series was produced by the legendary Louisa Wells and Giles Gear. And if you've been affected by anything we've talked about in our podcast today, the following organisations offer free and confidential support. Action on Addiction, who along with the Forward Trust have helped us put together this series, are a UK charity providing support to people who need rehab, as well as a wealth of resources for those battling addiction issues. They can be found at www.actiononaddiction.org.uk. For honest information about drugs and help and advice in the UK, head to www.talktofrank.com or call 0300 123 6600. Wearewithyou.org.uk are a charity who offer free confidential support to people in England and Scotland who have issues with drugs and alcohol. For information in Northern Ireland, go to services.drugsandalcoholni.info. In Wales, you can contact Dan247 at dan247.org.uk. If you are a child of an alcoholic, you can get advice and support from NACOA for free on 0800 358 3456. And importantly, please remember this, you are not alone. <laughs>